hold on for much longer because we need to keep to our schedule. So let me just have the honour of first introducing our speaker for this session, Mr. Sab Sembi. Mr. Sab Sembi work, has worked researching into the vulnerabilities of network-based CCTV systems and access con control systems. And during this time, he advised on specifying secure network CCTV systems, securing existing systems, speaking to police and local authority professionals. Today, he'll be presenting to us an end-to-end -end analysis of securing network CCTV systems. Do join me in welcoming Mr. Saab Sembi. Thank you very much. This is the first time I've spoken in Malaysia, and I'm um, really pleased to be here. But this is the first time for me it's exciting because of the fact that I don't have to sit here pressing things on a computer. I like to walk around quite a lot, so I'm going to do that. And all I have to do is click one of these things, and that's pretty good. Um, right, OK, let's get going. This is um, basically a slide on my background and my interest. Uh, I started into uh, my career in development, project management, done a lot of database work, um, web-based development. I, I learned security through the development route, uh, done a lot of secure coding. I have an interest in network hardware drive uh, devices and their security um, software security. So I, there's, there's lots there. I used to put down here my biography. Um, that's not very interesting, so I'd like to move on to the sort of things that are interesting. I've got a lot of slides to go through. Um, what you'll find is there's probably more slides that I'm going to have a chance to go through. And because of that, and because of the fact that I've got a lot of information, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to f sort of go through my slides, but I may not follow them exactly as, as, as we've got them. And I'll give you a lot of information here, there, and everywhere. But basically, I'll cover as much as I can. If there's anything that I've missed out, uh, don't worry. I am around, and you can get hold of me, and I can give you more information. So the aim is that I'm going to try and pack a lot in. Um, Session objectives, just to give you a background behind CCTVs. The role of CCTVs in network um, in, in law enforcement. Vulnerabilities and implementation. What I'm not going to cover is the why, um, why there are um, vulnerabilities or why you'd want to look into them in, in great detail. Uh, I'm not going to cover details of exploits and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not going to cover, uh, sorry, what I will cover is the non-technical vulnerabilities that are inherent in such systems. Now, those are quite important because those are the sort of things that you're not going to be able to pick up from books. You're not going to pick up those from uh, any, any, any internet sites. Those are things that you only learn by experience. So those are the sort of things I'm definitely going to spend a bit more time on. I have got more slides than I've got time for, as I said. Um, and, and, and what... I'm going to hope to show you is that this technology isn't really any different from any other technology you guys work with. Um, so with, with that, I'm, I'm going to get going. Oops. Right, a Cu couple of things that I need to point out. My position and view of security. I view security, and we divide it up in our organization into three. We believe that, you know, we have a division on, on in secure coding and secure coding frameworks. Uh, we have a division which looks at secure data. And as far as we're concerned, Everything else comes into architecture, infrastructure, uh, and so on. So having said that, that's the way that we, we, we like to try and work when we're working with CCTV systems. Uh, what was and is CCTV system? Now, when it was originally, um, when CCTV first came about, the way it worked was you had a camera and you had a, um, a monitor and a viewing station, and it was connected through a cable. And that was closed, and that's why it's called a closed circuit television. And it was actually closed because you couldn't get into it, you couldn't do anything uh, unless you try and snap the wire, put something else in between, and in those days, it really was closed. CCTV has been around for 50 years. However, in the last few years, um, there's been a variety of things that have been called um, CCTV. The first of these is uh, what I call open local broadcast TV. The second is open network TV. The third is closed network CCTV. Now, the last two of these are the main things that we're going to be looking at within this session. Um, but the first of these, these three that I've got down here, um, I need to mention because they're very important. And you're going to come across a lot of people who would tell you that what I call open broadcast television is actually wireless CCTV. What I call open broadcast TV is what if, if you look at all the adverts or you see equipment, is what's called wireless CCTV. Why it's not wireless CCTV is because it transmits on specified bandwidth 
which are agreed by local laws. And these vary from country to country. It could be 1.2, 2.4, or 5. Uh, and I say 1.2. Some countries it's 1.3, but effectively you know what I mean. And it works within short distances. I'm going to give you an example of this in a short while. Um, the technology is used for baby monitors. So if you go into your local electronics store and you see a baby monitor with a TV, that's the sort of technology this is. It's not real uh, CCTV. It's used in shops, hotels, small businesses. And last year and part of this year, we undertook a survey around London. We went out with the, some equipment and we tried to find out where people were using this stuff because it is very, very open and it is broadcast and anyone can pick it up. And we came across some embassies that had it as well, which was very, very surprising. That you, you, know, you wouldn't think that embassies would just buy equipment from a local electronics store and not worry about the security aspects of it. Uh, it is very fast growing uh, in usage, sold, as I said, as well as CCTV. Um, is this really CCTV? Are we really having this discussion? The reason I put that in because it's not CCTV. It's not closed. It is broadcast on uh, an open bandwidth. It's the sort of technology which, you know, your cordless phones that you use at home, it's the same technology in cordless phones. Uh, it's that simple, it's that straightforward. Um, and I do, seriously do believe someone should get sued on the Trade Descriptions Act. And in England, hopefully, I'm going to be able to get someone or find someone who's willing to start a case because I think there should be someone who does sue under trade descriptions. It's not wireless CCTV. Um, I'm going to give a, give a quick demo now. The way I'm going to demo this is I've got a camera here, which is what I call op wireless open broadcast. And I'm going to ask this volunteer here basically to write something. And we're going to point the camera to what they've written. Let me just switch that on. It's, uh, it is on now, yep. And then I'm going to give this little device here which is a nice, neat little device. It will pick up um, bandwidth from about 900 to 5. And someone on this side, um, you're going to look at this, and you're going to see what. Yep. So what did he write? Can you tell me what he wrote? Sucks. CCTV sucks. <laughs> Is, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Now, this little device can pick up, uh, as I said, what... <laughs> there you go. Thank you for that. Um, th this little device does pick up on a wide range of bandwidth. And these, th these devices aren't that expensive. Anyone can get a hold of them. Um, and they will pick up, what, as I said, what I call short-range uh, broadcast TV. And they come in all different shapes and sizes. And they are the, uh, used in, as I said, not so cool, cool toys. The reason I say not so cool, cool toys is because we use this equipment for when we're doing pen testing. Um, we're going to an organization. If we're supposedly doing surveillance for someone, you can fit these cameras into anything and everything you want. Um, we've got in our office uh, these little cameras where we use them when we go places, for example, in a pen. At the front of the pen is a camera. Top of the pen is a microphone. So if we're going and we want to record it, we've got a transmitter in the pocket. We can use that device. We can record everything that's going on. Um, we can have them in glasses, so it's right in the center, sunglasses. We've got them in earpieces. You can stick them in plants. You can stick them in a clock. You can stick them in um, the, what do they call them, fire alarms smoke alarms, smoke detectors. You can fit them into almost anything you want to. So they, are, they have a use, but they are certainly not wireless CCTV because they're certainly not closed yet. I wanted to spend just about enough time so that people definitely would understand this is TV of some sort, but it's not wireless CCTV. Yeah? OK. But if you're interested in any of these cool toys, let me know, uh, and, and I, I can tell you where you can get stuff from if you really are interested. Right, open network CCTV. Um, it's open to all, um, open to control by all, and open with restrictions, uh, open as an extra, uh, as an extra in it. There's, that's the different types of uh, open systems you're going to come across. Those which really are supposed to be open to all. Absolutely anyone and everyone on the internet can access them. Nobody really cares because it's nothing of value. As far as the person 
with the cameras concerned. So these are the sorts of cameras. If you search under Google, everyone, whenever I talk about CCTV cameras, uh, people say, oh, yeah, you can search them for Google. Is that what you really do? You know, you do Google hacking. Um, not quite, but if you, if you did look up cameras on the internet, you will find some cameras which are open to all, and there's cameras which are in universities, in zoos, and stuff like that. So they're open to all. Then you've got some which are um, open to control by all, which means, again, those ones that may be in a zoo or in a museum, the aim is that you can look at the exhibits and zoom in, and you can do a whole range of things. That's, that's the purpose of those ones. Uh, open with restrictions. Um, they are open for viewing, but you cannot change anything, supposedly. And then lastly, open as an extra net. Now, these ones are supposedly controlled within an environment in the same way that you might put things in your extra net. Um, and that's really what the main uh, uh, topic is today that I'm covering. Yep. Closed network CCTV. Um, these are rare to find as it's, it's, it's like box... Um, like boxing in a, in a PC, in case someone attacks it. So basically, um, you do not find closed circuit, sorry, open, uh, network CCTV systems which are closed within a network. And the reason you don't find it, it's just, as I said there, it's just like having a PC. You put it in a box. If you don't want it to get hacked, you put it in a box, you leave it somewhere, and you just don't connect it to anything. About as useful as that. If you don't connect a PC to things, you know, you're not going to find it very useful. So one of the purposes in terms of having CCTV, and one of the advantages that is sold, uh, open network CCTV sold, is the fact that you can enable people who need to look at different things to be able to look at them for surveillance and a whole variety of other reasons. For example, um, let's say around London you've got an area where there's a university, there's um, a hospital, and there's a big shopping centre. Now, if you've got someone who's committed a crime, they could go from one CCTV system to, to sorry, uh, an area where one CCTV system is used to an area where completely different CCTV systems use, and the ownership is different as well. So, because the ownership's different, uh, and the university and the hospital and the local authority want the police to be able to track the person from one place to another, they need their system to be open. So because they need their system to be open so the police can view it, that's really uh, what this refers to. Because if you didn't have it open, you might as well just lock it all up and not use it. Um, some of the advantages offered. Um, as I said, if you put it into a box, it does defeat the advantages. Uh, and there are some that do exist, but not in law enforcement. Uh, law enforcement ones, as I said, are definitely open, and they use them all over the place. In England, you may or may not know that, that we've got the most cameras anywhere around the world. We, we've got a camera at every main motorway junction facing both ways, so we know who goes off, who comes on. We've got them on zebra crossings. We've got them in shopping centers. We've got them absolutely everywhere. Yeah? Uh, and those are the law enforcement ones, the ones that law enforcement have access to. Um, unfortunately... Um, some do exist due to the ignorance of installers and sometimes politics. Um, as I said, the, the, most systems are sold open as, as, as being an advantage. However, um, except in the fact that you've got to secure them, if you buy them and you close them, you, what you're doing is you are reducing the functionality that they were built for. You're also reducing the opportunity that law enforcement likes to be able to share data. Um, and that's that's really what law enforcement are very interested in. And as I said, you, you don't get many that are completely closed. Uh, they will usually be local and using fiber optics. Um, and there's a clue there. The, the ones that use fiber optics, who can afford fiber optics? Uh, most of us can't. It is very, very expensive. And they use, the ones that use fiber optics you, are, are usually for military, government, and those types of uh, uses. Uh, we're not going to discuss that in this session very much. Um, what law enforcement try and do when they're using CCTV and how they justify. Some of the politics around this is quite important to understand because if you get an understanding of the background politics, you will understand how and why certain cameras are used. What I mean by certain cameras is the certain manufacturers, the certain types of system, the certain functionality. Yep. Um, the, the, the different cameras that they use, one, one of the reasons is obviously to reduce uh, antisocial behavior, uh, you are being watched, we know who you are, we've seen you before, don't do that. So it's, it's, it's trying to stop you doing anything bad. 
reducing petty crime, you're not going to get away with it because we've got you covered. Uh, surveillance, you look suspicious, let's follow you covertly. And that's, that's what most people think that systems are used for. Identify and search, um, it's to be able to ask for public assistance, for example, um, in the UK when the London bombings took place um, and the failed bombers that tried to that fell two weeks after the bombs that did succeed, basically the cameras' Im images were used to ask the public to help to find where these people were. And that's, that's the identifying search. Evidence, okay, we know you've done it. Here's the proof. That's the proof. So these, these, these are a variety of different reasons. And the quality of the camera and the type of camera that's used will be determined on what they're trying to do with the camera in terms of where it's placed. The other important thing in terms of role is the role of traditional perimeter security. This is within inside a building. Now, if you look at perimeter security, you know, if you, if you take the idea that there's a, a fence around something, and then after the fence, you might have another layer of security all the way through to the data center, and you might have a whole range of different controls. Well, the strange thing is, nowadays, because of the reliance on CCTV, you've got CCTV at every step of the way. Yeah. And that is quite dangerous, as you'll see as, as, as I go through the presentation. Um, in terms of understanding uh, CCTV systems, if you look at the components, there's a whole range of components uh, that go to make up the CCTV, and the functionality will be determined by the components. For example, the image conversion um, chip that's in there, uh, whether it's coupled uh, or CCD or CMOS, um, the intruder sensors, there's uh, control pan tilt zoom functionality, the day and night use. There's a whole range of different components. Now, each of these components has technology that enables it to work and, and, and function effectively as a whole. So you've got the remote viewing, you've got the audio, you've got the upgrading for software, compression, and email notifications. So all these things require some additional software or hardware or both. Services and protocols. This is quite important if you can understand uh, in terms of some of the things that you want the, the camera to do. Um, obviously, to be able to serve, sorry, to view the pictures remotely, you need something that's going to serve the pictures. And for that, a web server is used and, and, and a variety of web services. Then you've got to be able to update the firmware remotely, you've got FTP. Now, that's recent in most cameras. Most cameras used to have TFTP, uh, which uh, most of you guys will know, doesn't require any password at all. So you could update the firmware with your own version of the firmware, however you may have changed it in any way, shape, or form, uh, and they wouldn't have a clue. So you could have done that yourselves um, until recently on many of the cameras. You've got SNMP, TCP, UDP, um, DNS, dynamic DNS services, HTTP, HTTPS, Telnet, uh, shell scripting, PHP, and task schedulers. Now, with all these functionalities, not every single one, but majority of them uh, that are in the cameras, um, what you find is that the cameras are using Linux. And if they're using Linux, embedded Linux, they have to, because of the fact that it's open source, they have to make sure that anything that they use and they add on, they are making it available to other people to be able to see and, and, and functionality. Now, I know that most, many of those services that we've looked at in the cameras that we've looked at um, are, so, are, 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 are software where it was created by, in many cases, by students who were doing it as a research project while they were studying. And it, it, they're meant to update it at some time or another, but they never did. So it wasn't written with security in mind. Yep. Um, and, and, and that's quite worrying, really, if you look at uh, many of these. Um, web servers, there's a couple of those around which, which definitely are uh, and fit into that category. So many of these things here are definitely vulnerable. If you, uh, if you use your skills, you will find, and you go through it, and we, we've, we've, we've looked at a whole range of these. We can't make them available at the moment. What we are going to make available is we're going to have manufacturers with the model and with the software and the version of the software that is current within that model, and if there are any upgrades available. Now, from there, anyone that wants to can work out what vulnerabilities exist for that version of the software. Um, now, before we make that publicly available, we are going to offer this back to the manufacturers to make sure 
that they, if they want to change anything within a certain time period, they can do that. We don't want to release that publicly right now at the moment. Okay? Um, DVR's viewing system. So you've got a camera, you've got a viewing monitor, um, you've got a recording system um, that are connected. Sometimes a whole range of different um, middleware that goes in between. Now, I don't want to look at the middleware necessarily, but they have their own vulnerabilities. Um, so there's local recording, whether it's tape, CD, DVD, hard disk. Um, you get multiple camera recording. Uh, you can get it timed. You can get random. You can program them, the manual, the automatic. There's lots of different functionality. And one of the uh, interesting things is that all the technology that manufacturers have focused on in the last 10 years in CCTV systems has all been around functionality for the police to be able to use the images for what they want. None of the technology and the research that they've done have been around securing the systems. Yep. So if you look in London, for example, for congestion charging, when you drive into London within the congestion charge area, what happens is um, you, you, the CCTV camera will take an image and they will read the number plate. So there's special software which read the number plates. So then you've got additional software um, around face recognition systems. Then you've got additional intelligence software, and this intelligence software will look at whether or not somebody's likely to commit a crime. And there's lots and lots and lots of software that's available uh, all around images and what you can do with images and um, and all that sort of technology. It's not around securing the camera or anything to do with securing the camera. Um, and, and a lot of the functionality that I look at is event-based and image-based. Now, uh, this is a basic setup that you might have. Um, a monitor there. There's a couple of cameras there. Computer network. You've got wireless camera there. A possible setup, as I said. You've got DVR, multiplex. Um, and it can be, whether it's specific ca uh, cabling, coaxial, ethernet, You've got some traditional cameras in the system as well, um, some network cameras, and signal uh, receivers and transmitters. Um, there's, there's lots and lots of different setups. And if you look at um, the base traditional setup, if you have a camera in a motorway, for example, that's remote, that's going to be connected to the viewing station over Ethernet. There's going to be next to nothing in between or the camera is going to be uh, a remote, and then it's going to go through a firewall to go anywhere into where the viewing station is. However, to get from the camera to where it, the monitoring area is, it's going to travel over the internet. So that's one setup. Then you're going to get a whole range of other setups where a, a range of cameras feed into one place, and then those are fed through the internet. Uh, so, you, you know, th th there's variations on a theme, and all of them involve the fact that you've got cameras that are out there on the Internet Live that are miles away from where they're going to be viewed. Yep. And the changes in setup is usually not at the camera end because of the fact that it is remote. The changes in the setup is at your end where the monitoring stations are. Yep. Um, so network, network system components, network card, whether it's and then wireless um, or wired switches, routers. These are the obvious things. Now, on this slide, in some of the research that I've done, I like going to look at the original components and who are the component makers, what their views on what they're doing, and so on. Now, most of the uh, exhibitions I've been to looking at components, I like to go to the manufacturer and I say, right, OK, this is really, really good. I like the functionality. What is it that you're doing right now about security? And every single one over the last few years, whenever I've spoken to any manufacturer of components or of the final uh, CCTV system, every single one without fail has said, oh, well, basically, we leave the security up to the network guys. Yep. So they have distanced themselves in doing anything at all about securing the system. So they are leaving anything and everything to do with security to the network people. Now, given that uh, in a, in a um, corporate organization, you have lots and lots and lots of skills. And if, you, if any of you guys work within a corporate environment, you'll know that there are different skills for different parts of the network and the IT infrastructure. You know, be it the network administrators, the firewall guys, um, the guys that, that own the bandwidth and what you do with it, how it's distributed. Uh, and, and, you know, you're going to have lots and lots of different skills. Now, many of these skills 
are, are broken down with people who've got several years of experience. In the CCTV industry, if you look at the fact that traditionally CCTV cameras were installed and set up by people who had experience in radio and TV. And there were engineers in TV and radio, not in networks. And what many of the installers go through to be able to install network CCTV is a two to three day networking course. Now you know and I know that the guys that you have in your networks, would you allow someone to run your network for you, someone who's had two to three days of um, experience to install your network and run your network for you? The chances are you wouldn't. Yeah? However, all these systems are installed and run by people who've only got two to three days of experience in networking. And all that has been on a training course usually and none practical. Yep. Um, so all these things here, you know, we're, we're familiar with them, we've played around with them, we know that. The manufacturers leave all the security to the network level, the um, installers don't have an idea of the network. So basically what I'm saying to you is at the moment if you look at cameras, Everything is left to the network level and no one is controlling it and no one's running it, no one's caring about it, nobody's thinking about what's happening in detail about any of these. Um, similarities with other network embedded devices. Um, th this is where, where my background and where I came from. My, I had, uh, how I got into CCTV systems is because I was interested in embedded devices and I was interested in particular anything that would be networked and is remote and can't be run locally. Um, and the similarities are there's no graphical display, serves data, is remote controlled, security is left to the network level, and there's an embedded operating system uh, which, which runs the appropriate protocols and services. Um, technical problem areas, uh, and this is what I was pointing out earlier on, there's the network, there's the architecture, the hardware, the software, protocols, data passing. There's lots and lots of different layers within the camera and the components that work within the system and all of them have no one that's technically competent looking at them and quite often we see systems that are installed as I said by somebody who's got two or three days experience and they will come and design a system for you not understanding the network at all and that's quite horrifying and that happens all over the place wherever you go. Um, oops. Right, what are the implications of the last few slides? Um, so, so we've got a system which has lots of um, network system components. Um, it has similarities with other devices, so there's going to be lots of other devices on a network. Um, there's a whole range of problem technical areas, um, and there's no one looking at these, and no one that understands these from the CCTV point of view or network point of view. Um, and, and basically, you're left lots and lots of cameras all over the place, and no one is responsible for them and no one is monitoring them. No one's looking at what they're actually doing and how vulnerable they are or what can happen. Now, we've come across instances quite often where we say to network guys, listen, um, we, we think you've got some uh, network CCTV. And they say, no, we can't have. We know we haven't. We haven't authorized it. And then we find that there's a piece, surely enough, there's a PC somewhere where somebody has got full cameras and they've plugged them to the back of their PC just by using a a network CCTV card. So they've plugged these in and now they've got network CCTV and not know that they've got network CCTV. We come across this situation quite often. Yeah. Um, and the wrong focus, um, that's quite important because the focus, as I said, has, has, has been you know, blaming or leaving everything up to network guys. The, the focus has been on quality, image quality, it has been on producing good quality pan tilt zoom functionality. It's been on recording and recording functionality, the administration of the system remotely, uh, and even CCTV forensics is not what I thought it would be. You see, CCTV forensics, um, as its practice, is basically looking at how, if you uh, think you've caught someone on camera, how you can follow them step by step all over the different data that you've got in the different cameras and the different lots of images that you've caught. That's what CCTV forensics is. Um, for me, CCTV forensics should be about if someone is hacked into your CCTV system, how can you track them on your network to actually understand that it has actually been hacked? Um, sample camera unit setups. 
there's, there's, there's variations on a theme. I mentioned that earlier on. You get the one camera, which is local, and it's straightforward, and it's connected to you, um, your PC. You get the one too many on a PC card uh, uh, over a network, and I gave an example of that. Many too many on a PC, network locally, many too many on a network remotely. Most of the systems that are used by the police are usually of the last two. Um, and the important thing there is, no matter which of these that you look at, the police quite often have them set up um, such that, as I said earlier, you've got the camera remotely and always the cameras remotely. The only difference is where it fits into locally, where the monitoring stations are. Yep. Um, <laughs> this is my, um, I think that this is my slide that my wife asks me to put into every presentation I do. It's called the Pulp Fiction Break. Yes, it is. Uh, I'll give you a quick history of the Pulp Fiction Break. The Pulp Fiction Break, my wife says, if you're doing a presentation for, more than an hour, for up to an hour, you need to have a Pulp Fiction Break to make sure nobody's fallen asleep. Originally, when this came about, and I don't do this at conferences now, if anyone's watched Pulp Fiction, basically there's a scene right at the start where they're in the restaurant, and the lady stands up and she says, if any of you certain people move, I will execute every last one of you. And I used to put that in there to wake up the people who may be in the, in, in, in the session and may be wanting to sleep. So basically, this is the Pulp Fiction break, and we're going to go through it fairly quickly. Right, CCTV implementation issues. There's a whole range of issues that create their own vulnerabilities within, within the system. Data sharing, live and archived. Basically, all the functionality I've been talking about uh, falls into a lot of these categories that I'm going to cover now. In terms of data sharing, you get a whole range of different organizations, different police services, different police units, uh, and different government units that might need to share the data. They might need to share the live data, for whatever reason, and they might need to share the archive data. Example of sharing archive data is basically uh, where, you know, like the, I gave the example of the London bombers earlier on. There, they tracked that the London bombers had been doing a reconnaissance trip to London from Leeds. And they looked at all the archives and found out when they came down, what they'd done, where they stopped, and so on. So that's archive stuff. So there is a whole range of functionality built around sharing data. Now, to be able to share data, obviously, on a network, you need to have the right controls in place. Unfortunately, when these things are built, the controls are not into place because they're built for functionality, not for security. Uh, usefulness of open and closed systems, I've covered that to an extent, um, because basically, you know, to be able to make any real use of it, it has to be open to a certain extent. Um, now, I'm going to throw in a couple of things there. I, I, I've seen CCTV systems abused on, in, in films quite often. Three really good examples, and these are uh, quite possible and probable. Some of them uh, may not be true uh, as today as it used to be. The first one is, if anyone's seen the Thomas Crown Affair, a couple of years back, the, in, in how he achieved what he did in terms of um, abusing the CCTV system was, he attacked the air conditioning, and when the air conditioning, I can't remember if it went up or went down, affected the CCTV camera. That is absolutely true because all CCTV systems have a certain temperature within which they can operate. And that's why when you're buying a camera for indoor or outdoor use, you need to choose carefully. Yep. Um, another one, if you've got, um, sorry, in, in, in Ocean's 11, um, in that one there's, there's a scene where they're in a lift and the lift has been um, shot before and then another one uh, straight after that where they've got a scene within the vault and that vault scene has already been shot. So what you can do is, uh, what they've done was they put in a feed in the middle. It's like the man in the middle attack. However, the modern, more modern day version of that really would be attacking the DNS and that you can really do that with, with the system. The third example, uh, and that's quite, pro uh, is quite probable, if anyone's seen the Bourne Ultimatum, in that there's a scene fairly earlier on where Bourne is in, uh, Jason Bourne is in London at Waterloo Station. And the CIA are using the cameras of 
British Transport Police, because I, I, I assume that they own the cameras within the transport area, the CIA are using them, they're zooming in, they're tracking him, they're following them, they're moving the cameras around remotely from the States to track Bourne and to kill the person that they kill. So, you know, all these things are quite probable because the system allows, you know, people to be able to take control of these, this, uh, the, these systems. So remote control is very, very important to these systems because you're not going to be by the camera. Um, and uh, the question, what is the network? Well, the thing is, a network can be anything when it comes to CCTV systems. They, it's difficult to define, to define what the network is, whether the CCTV system connects to the network as a network or it's part of the whole big network until you unravel what you've actually got. Um, current ne ne um, network setups, different uh, differences. There's, I won't go into that at the moment. I'm just aware of the time. Um, Whose network is it? That's a very, very political one because quite often um, different CCTV systems are owned by different people compared to who owns the network and you have some conflicts there as to what they can and cannot allow if there is an issue. That is a very political issue and it's cropped up in the UK a few times. Installation security, I've mentioned that. Uh, interoperability between technologies where you've got traditional CCTV systems and They've been around a while, and then you've updated some of the other um, cameras or added to existing cameras. So you've got traditional network CCTV and what's um, new network TV systems. So you've put them all, all together. Basically, all you've done is you've added a few more components so you can view them and make the traditional closed-circuit TV uh, work onto your network, and that's through middleware. Uh, and there are lots and lots of products around that enable you to do that. Again, our research has shown that they are vulnerable because nobody's that interested in security. They're all interested in the, um, uh, leaving the, tech, the security to the network level. Responsibilities for different elements, um, again, for different parts of the system in terms of recording. So you might have some people owning the cameras and where it's recorded and what happens to recording is controlled by someone else. Um, Control of the overall system is different. Uh, recording where it is, where it's based, the type of recording it is, etc. Privacy laws vary. Um, alerts and who deals with them. So, for example, if you've got night cameras at one place, you're not expecting to see people there, you can set up alerts. So, basically, if anyone comes into a room, there will be an alert, an email that could be sent, or there could be another alert that's sent, and who deals with that. So, th there's a whole range of functionality around that that could be abused. Uh, we, we've done um, tests where we've basically set up hundreds and hundreds of alerts for next to nothing happening and then get, get these alerts sent and, and create a fault or, 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 or uh, sorry, create a situation where it seems as if there's a fault on the system. Um, lack of established network standards for secure installation. That's, that's, a, that's a fairly big one because there are no established standards at all. In the same way in security, we've got a whole range of standards that have been coming up um, that people have been looking at, how you can secure this, how you can secure that, the ways to audit things and so on. Um, so lack of auditing, pen testing approach. Um, there's lack of technical network maintenance and support from a security perspective from the outset. Basically, um, when you have your network in a, a corporate environment, you know you need to uh, maintain it. You need to make sure you know what's going on it. So you may well be monitoring it in big detail. On these, no one has a clue. No one thinks it's useful or important. So if somebody managed to find a camera that they shouldn't have access to, basically they could sit there trying to um, get into the administrator's password, and they could do it manually, and they could be sitting there two years, keep trying different passwords every single day, and no one would know. Or they could sit there with a password cracker and maybe crack it within two or three minutes, and again, no one would know, and, and, you know because no one's monitoring it. Yeah. Um, finance, who pays for the system? That is a fairly big one. And it, it, you know, there, there's, there's lots of things here which seem as if they're not vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities as a result of that is, uh, you know, how, at the moment in England, a, a, an example is the fact that cameras were financed about 10, 15 years ago by the government through capital expenditure. Now, the camera has long exceeded its, uh, its use-by date. 
So the camera should not currently be used at all because the, the, the technology is no longer reliable and if anything happened to it, no one would necessarily know. So who pays for it is an issue. Now, you've got a similar situation with some of the early network cameras that came on board as well. Again, there are, there, there are issues around that. So who pays for it is an issue. And if you were looking at a particular system, understanding all these things is very, very important in terms of if, you, if you're doing an audit and you're trying to find out, you will need to know who's doing what, who's responsible for what, where it came from, how old it is, um, and how the decisions were made. Uh, manufacturers via security, I've covered that. Installer experience, again, I've mentioned that. Uh, system ad administrators, network knowledge. Most of these guys do not have a clue. If you ever get a chance to go into where all these screens are, and you, the, the monitoring stations, around London there used to be, if I remember correctly, 11 all around London at various places. What they're doing now is they're going to put them all together into three separate areas. None of these three areas are going to have necessarily, and I say necessarily because this may change, anyone that I know that's a systems administrator that understands networks and what networks do, how they work, what you're supposed to do to maintain everything, uh, and, and, and everything in the way that you want it to, that's going to give you um, the CIA. Yeah. Basics in terms of um, securing a system. What I've tried to give you a background of is, that because there is quite a lot there, is that everything is left to the network level. There are vulnerabilities that aren't necessarily at the network level, which you can attack uh, fairly easily. However, in terms of securing the cameras, the cameras don't come with any built-in security. So your only chance, really, of securing the system is at the network level. Yep. Um, and in terms of at the network level, because the product itself uh, has got some things that you can change, um, these are the basics, and I do mean the basics that you can uh, try and approach to make sure that the system is much harder to find. So for example, change the admin page. In terms of changing the admin page, we've done a lot of research work in the past where we've, um, where, where, where we've, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna stop there. I, I, I've got a quick demo I want to do. Basically, I, I've been doing some work with uh, some of the universities, and I've been supervising some research projects of the master's students, security research, uh, stu uh, security students. And one of them didn't really know anything about CCTV systems at all. He's, he, he, he wrote a project, and what happened was I said to him, right, look, what I want you to do is think like a hacker, try and find some cameras. When you found some cameras, let me know. He couldn't find any cameras. He said, how do I search for them? We went through it, and in about five minutes, I showed him how he could find some cameras um, using, and he could find any camera he wanted fairly quickly. Then I said to him, right, okay, what I want you to do is, again, just to show how easy it is, I want you to try and um, see if you can set up some basic pages to control the pan, tilt, zoom of remote cameras. So I want you to show that you can control cameras remotely that you've seen on the internet. So what I want to do is, if we could switch over the screen to the demo, if we can switch over. I need to take the timer off. Up, oh, right, good stuff. Okay, it's basically this, this, this interface you see here, this was developed by a student, master student, um, and basically, he didn't spend too long on it. It's a very quick demo. He put together a couple of pages on a couple of cameras where the camera can involve some remote control. And he's not been taught in scripting very, very well. So he put together this page, and it didn't take him very, very long to, to, to put into place. Now, the, what we've got here, do you want to play around with it and show some of the controls? Do you want to? Zoom in or move around or whatever. It is, this is a very slow connection. But you can do a whole lot and you can develop a page because mo these, these, these cameras have quite often have, well, they all have a web server, but they quite often have PHP to enable that remote control. They have software developer kits. They have a whole range of functionality which enable you to do that. And the focus, as I said, has been on functionality. So they've tried to enable people to be able to do this 
to an extent, but they haven't provided the functionality so that you can control it and only you and not anyone else. All right, yep, there we go. We've just zoomed in. Don't know if anyone noticed that. But you can do a whole range of things, and you can control them, and you can create scripts. The session yesterday, I don't know how many of you attended it, which was on JavaScript. Everything that was covered in that session on JavaScript, I'd say go back to that if you can. Look at the presentation. Everything you can do in that session, you could do on, to these web servers running uh, on these cameras. And, and a quick question before we go back to the demo. Any, anyone here, if you, if you had a web server, where would you put your web server on the network? Most people would put it DMZ, absolutely right. However, most of these cameras are out there, and they're not in any sort of DMZ at all. Even if they are local cameras around a building, they're not in any DMZ. So, you know, and, and a lot of these cameras, what you're able to do is use them for a whole variety of different, um, how can I say, Lots of different fun. You can spam from them. You can, uh, you know, use them for cross-site scripting. You can do lots and lots and lots of things because these are servers, so web servers that are running on the cameras. And anything you can do a normal web server to an extent, in terms of abuse, you're going to be able to do on many of these as well. Yep. If we can just flip back to the slides again, and I'm going to try and finish there. We're, we're, we're building loads of other things like this, but once um, we've got a couple of other things that we've finished, we're going to make them all available. So that, that screen that you saw um, is sitting on a dummy website at the moment, and that website you, you won't have access to. Um, but we will give people access, and we'll show sample scripts that people can create themselves if they're interested and so on. Um, coming back then, so in terms of, you know, what would you do to, to, to protect the end-to-end? -end? First thing is, is basically change the admin page. You can change pages, and you can change the search strings that Google uses to find that page in the first place. Yep. Because at the moment, all these systems are sold with a default admin page, and Google indexes it. So you can change that index, um, so it's not so easy to find. Change the robot.txt um, file. Uh, change and extend the password, because the only form of protection you've got really and truly uh, is nothing more than a password. Yeah? That is about all you've got. It stopped. It's gone. <laughs> In the meantime, anyone got any questions? There is a lot of work being done at the moment, and we're going to make that available. Um, okay, we're going to make a lot of the work that we're doing available, uh, you know, generally freely available um, and open source. We are working on, on a couple of projects that I'll come back to in, in, in a minute. Um, yeah, change the extended password. Ensure the use uh, of modal windows for password entry. That is to get to stop the script kiddies setting up stuff. Nothing more than that, because it's not going to stop most of us. We know how to get around that. But you can stop the basic um, script kiddies from getting through there. Separate from the rest of the corporate network. Uh, firewall, in terms, sorry, separate from the rest of the network, uh, corporate network. Again, if you can uh, set up DMZ, that's great. If you can't, and you can separate it in other ways, that's great. But one other thing that you really and truly must do um, is if you have got your CCTV system running on your network is in the same way that if you're working on a security project, you will look at your data and you will work out, uh, in terms of your data, you work out what, how important it is as an asset to you. Equally, you need to do the same with your cameras. You need to determine how important each of these are as an asset to you. And if you do that, then you can prioritize, in terms of the cameras that you've got, what bandwidth priority you're going to give to each of them. And that's very important, because I've come across um, situations so often where everything's running on the local network. There's no prioritization of bandwidth, and the cameras are eating up bandwidth and stopping and slowing down the rest of the network. Yeah? Um, 
firewall, none of these often have firewalls, so that's very important. Place in the DMZ, change and secure the things you can, and place appropriate controls for the rest. Um, uh, and that really is the, the, the basics. The unfortunates of securing end-to-end -end network CCTV, the architecture, the specification, quite often there isn't a specification. Um, the data, um, secure according to risk, as I've mentioned. The client applications, network monitoring, because it doesn't actually happen, and it should happen. The people involved, uh, because they are professionals, but they don't know about networks. They know about CCTV systems, not about networks. Support and maintenance, that is vital. Um, right, takeaways from this session. Since security is left to network level, deal with it. You know, it is up to network people to deal with this and do something with it. Because at the moment, in many respects, that's about the only real control you have. Um, you can do a lot with the technology. It's not that new. It's anything but in most cases. So what I'm saying to you is, you're used to all this technology. The only thing is, people don't think of it. Oh, right, OK, CCTV, well, that's something I'm not used to. But the fact of the matter is, most of the technology that's in there, you understand it from everything else that you do. So it's not really anything new. People are important. Technology can't overtake that yet. Um, you need to train your people in terms of what they do, what they don't do, how you can make sure that people are using the system effectively, if they connect anything on, what they do with it. Policies, procedures, standards, guidelines, whatever you do anywhere else, you need to put those in place. Plan and organize like you would any other technology. Test, test, test. Pen test it. You know, try and break into it. Anyone can. And you know, then you know whether or not you're doing the right things in terms of the network. Most people don't even bother trying to do that. Haven't we seen these things before? But why aren't people um, just doing them for this technology? It is true. You know, there is nothing new. You know, controlling it end-to-end -end isn't that difficult because you've got the skills that you've got, and you can do that. Um, what are the, where are the manufacturers going with this technology? They're going WiMAX, uh, mobile phone networks, emergency phone network integration, behavioral applications, great integration databases, great integration with other technologies like RFID and biometrics. This is the sort of thing, that in terms of what is current and you can do right now, is... Um, the technology is there in terms of biometrics that uh, you can get RFID readers that can read um, about from here to the end of the room. You can connect it to a database and you can connect that to a CCTV system. The technology is there for you to be able to read the RFID chip inside, um, let's say, an ID card of the person who just came into the room. It can read that. Then it can connect to a database to that person's uh, ID and say, right, this face and this RFID card do not match. This person has stolen someone's, someone's ID card. The technology is there right now. At the moment, I don't know of anyone that's actually put them together in terms of government use. Uh, there's lots and lots of more software developer kits going to be available, more PHP modules and remote control. Why is this exciting? Well, it's exciting for a whole variety of reasons. Embedded devices are the new PCs. There are going to be so many more embedded devices around, access control systems, biometrics, and so on. There's lots and lots. Um, lots of embedded operating systems, um, network chips, newer ones, encryption, IPS. You're getting embedded IPS, getting embedded databases, the possibilities of WiMAX. Basically, all this is going to be a lot of fun for security professionals. There's going to be a lot going on that we would not have considered because you're joining up so many different types of technology. Where to from here? The scary bits, integration of technologies, as I said earlier, RFID and biometrics, to CCTV systems, open access to foreign governments. I gave you a film example of CIA you know, using um, the cameras in the Brit British uh, Transport Police, but there's going to be lots more uh, uh, going on. Um, open access to criminals, growth, where did our privacy go? There's going to definitely going to be lots and lots of growth in CCTV systems. Um, England isn't the only place. If you look, the, the growth in network CCTV systems around the world is absolutely phenomenal. More and more uh, governments, local authorities around the world are installing these systems. Um, anything can be justified. Uh, I've seen that so many places. You know, you can install a camera anywhere and say, oh, right, this is important. Backdoor into networks. Um, just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean that they're not out to get me. And I've changed that a bit. Just because I'm not paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get me either. Yeah? Uh, because there are going to be more and more cameras around. I've got 
a couple of slides after this, and I took them from a presentation I'd done on secure coding. Basically, I'd done a, a presentation on secure coding, um, a risk-based secure coding, and I put them into here at the end, which when you download them, you'll see. Basically, anything that applies to any other aspect of security in your approach to security should not differ just because this is a slightly different technology. Yeah? Anything that you know is relevant to this technology. Any questions? And my last point I, I will, will re-emphasize, if anyone is in, in doing some research uh, or wants any direction in doing some research, I'm more than happy to point people out uh, in, in the right, right way, uh, wherever they might, whatever they might want to look at. Any questions? Questions from the floor? I think you're off the hook. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Sapsembi. Thank you.